A potentially life-threatening parasite in ticks capable of causing malaria-like illness is more prevalent now than doctors realized and can be transmitted through blood transfusions. It has infected so far at least 122 people since 2000, says a study by researchers at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The finding does not mean that transfusions are dangerous, only that physicians need to be aware of some of these invisible illnesses. How they're going to do that is beyond me. Up next, the story of Tom Greyer. Get ready for that story on Coast to Coast AM. Oh, let me tell you about Tom Greyer. He's with us tonight on Coast to Coast, a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Biology, MS in Medical Microbiology from the University of Minnesota. Tom worked in the pharmaceutical industry when he contracted Lyme disease. And here he is on Coast to Coast. Tom, hi. Welcome to the show. Hey, good to have you with us. Oh, thank you. Tell me, Tom, tell me your story, because the story is probably as important as the message you're going to give us tonight. Well, it's hard to really say where it began, but I would say when I was a, a graduate student at the University of Minnesota at the medical school, I was taking a hematology class, and we had to do blood smears on all the uh, fellow students and so on. And I looked at my blood smear, and as I was doing this, the instructor said, well, you should only find about 1% eosinophil. But my slide uh, was just filled with them. And I I looked at this, and every student wanted to see them because uh, on a blood smear, they're beautiful. They look like big red raspberries. (laughs) And... uh, Let's look at them under a microscope, right? Right. And um, there was really no explanation for this, but when you start approaching, you know, 7, 8, 9% uh, eosinophils, they start talking about a fatal disease called eosinophilia. And uh, I had absolutely no symptoms. I I felt pretty good. Uh, In fact, at this time in my life, I was running marathons in the woods and was in the best shape of my life. And then I got shingles. Uh, this was really unusual. And they did a blood count. And my uh, neutrophils and white blood cell count was way low. And this is unusual. And then I got nonspecific urethritis, which was treated with tetracycline. And my shingles went away. And my blood count came up. So they said, well, it must have been an infection, but we don't know what. I think at that time in 1977... I might have contracted a disease that wasn't even discovered at the time, which was ehrlichiosis, and that's what accounted for this unusual blood smear. And when I was treated with the tetracycline, it masked or hid the symptoms of Lyme disease, which I probably got at the same time. And it suppressed these symptoms for many years. And then around um, the late 80s, like 1989 or so on, extremely tired, depressed, uh, fuzzy thinking, heart palpitations all the time. And uh, there was really no explanation for it. And then by the time, I would say, uh, late 1990, it was now pretty obvious that the doctors were thinking multiple sclerosis. And they had not, uh, you know, wanted to reach this conclusion. They were were trying hard to figure out what was going on, but they didn't really have any other ideas. And I had numbness and tingling in my hands and feet. I had uh, pressure in my head, severe pressure in my head, visual disturbances, sensitivity to bright lights. I was running extreme fevers off and on and having uh, just unusual night sweats that were just drenching me. And... uh, The best they could come up with in two years was multiple sclerosis. I had gotten to the point where I couldn't really drive. I was disabled. I uh, could not function. I could not work. And I collapsed in the street, and I was taken to a hospital. And my doctor, which um, he was on vacation, and so the doctor that came on duty Monday morning was a neurologist who just six hours earlier had come from an international Lyme disease conference. And she looked at my chart and she said, where's your Lyme test? And I said, I I don't know. No one ever said the word Lyme to me in two years. Yeah, in all those years, nobody brings up Lyme disease. Exactly. And in five minutes, she had looked at my chart and determined that 
Well, she said outright. She said, we'll do the whole workup for multiple sclerosis and such, but I think you have Lyme disease, and we're going to start you on treatment today. And she was absolutely right on the money. Uh, but I found out later that she had a very small working knowledge of Lyme disease, and it became a very, very difficult situation for the next few months, uh, maintaining treatment and trying to get better. And I would say that overall, it took about 10 years to really turn the corner to uh, go from a waiting list for a nursing home to uh, being able to drive and work again. So for a couple years and then through these 10-year period, you've got this disease, this horrible, wretched disease, and nobody's helping you, Tom. Well, they didn't know what to do. I mean, when you get a multiple sclerosis tentative diagnosis, it's pretty much the end of the line. I mean, they give you steroids or whatever the next MS drug is that they want to try, but really that's the end of the diagnosis. And that's really unfortunate because I think they're not looking at other possibilities. It's so entrenched in their minds as physicians that multiple sclerosis is not caused by an infection that they don't think of the possibility that it's something else. Tom, let's turn the clock back. How do you think you got this? Oh, I have no doubt that uh, all that time I spent running in the woods. You know, I would run in the woods here in Duluth, Minnesota, and uh, I would look at people running on the roads and think, why are they doing that? That, that must just be killing their legs. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> now I, uh, I see the, the wisdom of it. I, I jog on a treadmill, and I say the same thing that you did when I see people you know, in, in 85 to 100 degree weather jogging down the streets, they look like they're going to pass out and die. Yeah. And I, and I keep saying, why are they doing this? They're killing themselves slowly. Anyways, you're, you're, you're saying, though, you think you got it in the woods. How did you get it? Well, uh, Lyme disease is transmitted by the bite of a tick. And uh, more specifically in this area, it's the deer tick or the exodi scapularis, sometimes called the black-legged tick. And this is the main vector for sure. Uh, there are speculation that other uh, ticks and, and uh, insects might possibly transmit the disease or even other transmissions of the disease that don't involve uh, insects or ticks. But uh, that is yet to be fully proved and accepted. So a tick generally will bite you but stay on the body. I mean, I remember days when I used to take ticks off my Labradors uh, these little things, these buggers would stick inside of the dog. They wouldn't let go. And you had to be very careful, Tom, that if you pulled them, sometimes you would separate the head from the body, and you didn't want that to happen. In your particular case, do you think a tick just bit you and jumped off you, or what happened to it? Well, I was in the woods all the time. I, I was bitten by many ticks, but in you know the late 80s, uh, really the knowledge of tick-borne diseases it wasn't anything close to what we have now. Uh, the Internet was sort of in its infancy. There wasn't any information. I'll tell you, when, uh, when I finally got the diagnosis of Lyme disease in 91, uh, the Internet was just absent of any good information, any accurate information. So... Uh, we just didn't have the awareness. So I, I was bit many times, and growing up as a kid, you know, we're bit by ticks, and we don't think anything of it. But in the long run, these little ticks are cesspools. They have many different organisms in them, and the trouble with Lyme disease is they can survive in your body. These bacteria can survive in your body for decades. I don't like ticks, and I don't like mosquitoes, Tom, and I don't know why God made ticks. Well, I have no know, idea. Uh, you know what uh, Mark Twain said? He said that God only made two mistakes, the French and the fly. <laughs> well, you never know. You uh, never know. Now, the, but there, Pliny there, the Elder, going back to 67 AD, Pliny the Elder pointed out that the foulest creature on earth was the tick. I, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. I mean, what truly, you know, if we have creatures on this planet that have specific reasons for being here, why is there a tick? What, what's its purpose? Yeah, it. it um, well, that's the thing. If you believe in in evolution and evolutionary niches, uh, this tick uh, is a survivor. And um, until something comes along that's going to destroy it, it's going to survive. Just like sharks have survived for millions of years. Is is there any data that tells us 
how many people get bitten by ticks every year? I don't know if they collect that. Oh, that would be almost impossible to collect. Uh, we can tell you that we have CDC surveillance data of how many people contract Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. Uh, in 2009, about 29,000 cases were reported nationwide. But the CDC surveillance criteria is very stringent, and so it excludes a lot of actual cases, plus the doctors aren't reporting on a regular basis. So some studies have shown in areas where we get the CDC reporting figures that when we actually go and check how many people were treated for Lyme disease, it's sometimes 10 or even 20 times what is reported. Wow. Yeah. So which, that, which, that could be 290,000, 400, 500,000 people. Yes. But, you know, going back to what you said before, when you pull off a tick, you, the head remains. Well, these ticks are insidious little creatures. What happens is when the tick bites you, they actually secrete a glue, and they glue their head in place. And then they start secreting an antihistamine, so there's no itching, uh, an anticoagulant, so your blood keeps flowing. And um, when they're all done feeding, they release an enzyme that releases the glue, and then they can come out. Now, if you try pulling that tick off before he's done feeding, he's just going to stay glued in place. Interesting. I used to light a wooden matchstick, blow it out, and then with that red ember tip, I'd hold it on the tick, and most of the times on the dog, it would let itself go, yeah. and then I'd just grab it with tweezers. Yeah, it's gratifying to kill ticks, but we don't recommend that method of removal. It's best if you can actually uh, slide something into the skin and pull the head out uh, before you touch the body. One of the things is we, we know that this tick regurgitates its blood meal, but it does this, you know, 24 to 36 hours into feeding. But if you were to take that tick and squeeze it, you would actually be injecting the bacteria into your your body so you would speed up that whole process now there is some controversy with Lyme disease is there not Tom uh, I would say there's no disease on this planet that is more controversial at this point why is that well that is a big can of worms um, it is complicated and it is convoluted it is a mixture of misunderstood microbiology and politics and conflicts of interest uh, it would read like a mystery novel if you ever really put all the pieces of the puzzle together. I think what happened is there's no doubt in 1975 when Lyme disease was first described that they got a lot of things wrong and they just never went back and apologized or backtracked and started over. They just kind of built up on this mythology that they had started. Uh, but truly, they got a lot of things wrong for a new disease. How easy is it now to diagnose Lyme disease? Well, it's, it's easy if you get a tick bite and a bullseye rash. Uh, any physician that's familiar with a, a uh, erythema migrans rash, and by the way, when I say bullseye rash, that's great if you have one, but most of the Lyme rashes are solid red, and they expand over time. And so if you were to trace the border of your rash on day one, on day two, three, four, the rash would expand beyond what you have uh, outlined. And how big is the rash initially, Tom? Well, well, that's debatable, too. We have a Lyme expert here in